Good afternoon. Um, guts is a some subject very close to my heart. Uh, many, um, literally, I suppose. Um, it seems very polite once you've knocked the animal on the head to eat it all. And um, so it's exciting to be here discussing guts. And but their guts have a a feel. I mean, it's um. That animal's spleen, when it's in love, swells. It stops doing guts, becomes something beautiful. Or tripe can steady and uplift at the same time. Magical. But anyway, I'm not here to discuss guts, sadly, as much as I could. I'm here to um, introduce my favourite chef in the world, Margaret Henderson. Thank you very much. Uh, am I doing that right? Yep. Uh, thanks so much for having me, everyone, and um, it is an honour. Um, so, anyway, the passion, the probe, and the problem. That's my title. Where, why am I here? Well, I wasn't quite sure, except I once banged on to Rene for a while. I was overexcited one night. Too many chefs in the room. But I do love a chef and often think I could write a book about my life and chefs. When I was a young chef, I liked nothing better than the creative, steamy, competitive, hard atmosphere of the kitchen. The more chefs, the better. The more there was to do, the better. And I still seemed to have so much energy that I could carry on into the night with my kitchen mates and still be fresh the next morning. Not so much anymore, but, you know, I try. Now, the theme of this talk is guts. And I'm going to use the old Anglo-Saxon meaning of the word guts, which is courage, like a lot of people. Courage. As we all know, it takes a lot of courage to cook and run restaurants, to push forward and to make it work. For a long time, I lacked confidence and spent many years sitting back on starters and not taking on the more responsible jobs. Then one New Year's Eve, I said, come on, Margot, and I made it my New Year's resolution. Whew, shaking a bit. To push myself into the unknown, into the place I knew I could and should be because after all, I was ambitious and still am, just like the next person. And it was amazing. As soon as I said yes, I, I made that resolution and everything fell into the place. From that moment on, I've always said, yes, you can. Well, I try and say, yes, yes, you can, instead of no, you can't. And in the year that followed, that first year I went for it, I was given the opportunity to run a kitchen and was made head chef at a new restaurant opening in Notting Hill. I didn't have much idea what I was doing, but I knew I had to put together a team. And that's exactly what I did. We all went for it. Peter Gordon, a great force and a calming influence. Catherine Barraclough, she had a gentle touch and her food was delicious. I read like crazy. I read a lot of women writers that I still read and love and cook with. Elizabeth David, Stephanie Alexander, Alice Waters, Mary Sue Milliken, loads of others. It was inspiring to read about women who were succeeding, not only as cookery writers, but as chefs as well. There were also a few blokes, of course. But I was definitely heading to cooks who cook simply and allowed their ingredients to speak for themselves. Well, Elizabeth David, she changed the world of food in Britain, along with Machala Hazan. They brought European regional food to Britain and introduced aubergines and haricot beans to a land that was eating white sliced bread. I was very inspired by these women, and I looked up to them, and they helped me move forward, and in more ways than I can say. I might just have a quick sip of water, quickly. <laughs> um, anyway, a few years later, and one day, there was this gorgeous, generous man sitting opposite me, and we knew very quickly we were destined to run a restaurant together. I knew he was wonderful, and I sensed his brilliance with food instantly. So I suggested we open a restaurant, and he said, I don't know why we haven't thought of it before. We'd known each other about four days, or maybe two. <laughs> <laughs> and it happened that Fergus and I opened the French House dining room. The quails came in, and I, being a cook of the 80s, started boning them all out. And of course, Fergus said, no, we will cook them whole. 
It was giddy, giddy times of love and cooking together. We did battle away over the menu, but it was a partnership over the stove. Then Fergus went off to St. John <laughs> and did all his stuff. And I stayed at the French, and that's when Fergus and I started having children. Children, as we all know, they take your world, your love, and in my case, they also took my food. And it took quite a few years once I came away from looking after small children to find my courage again. I am still rebuilding. It's a little like the bionic woman. We can rebuild her. We can make her better than before. She will cook again. <laughs> it's my mantra. <laughs> but, um, but this time, it was even harder than the first time, and that got me thinking. I was terrified all the time. Well, I still am, and especially in front of you lot. And at first, my fears just seemed to be the normal ones. Am I good enough? Can I prove myself? Can I cook that dish well enough? Will I fuck it up? Will I be screamed at? Will they like it? All that stuff that goes on and on. But then I began to realize there is another problem. Women don't need as much courage as men. They need more. They face an extra difficulty. I am always interested in why there are not more women running kitchens. Women through history have always been nurturing. They're loving, they love cooking. They've been cooks in the professional sense. Women love to cook. But they're not around. I mean, obviously, there's quite a few here, but this is a quite a special. But, you know, out there, it's like blokedom, boys' club. <laughs> they're missing from our... They're missing from our, from our public cuisine. They're not in charge, and they, they are still the outsiders. And here is a reason, <laughs> you know, the sort of reason. There is a difference be between men and women's approach to food. In fact, I think there, that, this is my theory, and maybe this is the wrong place to say it, but since it's courage, guts is the theme here, I'm going to risk saying it. But there are actually two kinds of cooking. A really great restaurant, is aware of both and finds a way to combine them. There is male cooking and female cooking, feminine cuisine as well as masculine. Well, what does that mean? I think it's ancient. I think it goes right back to the Stone Age. Women produce food, men provide food. In other words, we breastfed while the men went out and hunted. Both were necessary. We need both to survive and both are still in our instincts. Our anatomies decided that. But today, in the big picture, in the food industry and in the restaurant industry, I think that the male approach dominates and the female one can be sometimes overlooked. Food in a lot of kitchens is treated as well, not the enemy, but as a problem to be solved, something to dominate, something that has to give up its secrets. Kitchens are turning into laboratories. They are filled with tools and weapons. Kitchens today, kitchens today, uh, am I repeating myself? Yeah, kitchens today are filling up with vacuum packers, sous vides, probes, and all the other stuff. And sometimes the instinctive part seems to get lost. It makes me weep to be told that to comfy a duck leg in a plastic bag in water is just as good as comfying it in duck fat. I mean, it's just terrible. Anyway. <laughs> it's terrible! Terrible! The loving, nurturing side of the trade, the instinctive side, I would say the feminine side, is being overlooked. Just think of the food industry as a whole, and I know a lot of this has been said much better than me, okay? We all know terrible things happen out there, battery farming, genetic modification, so that we can drench the crops and the environment with pesticides, and so on and so on. It's when this approach, and I think the male approach, the hunter had to go out and make war on nature. It's when this approach dominates and obscures the other side, working with nature, that it leads to disaster. Look at mad cow's disease. Anyone in their right mind could tell instinctively that feeding rendered dead sheep to cows was not a good idea. But oh no, the money boys, the scientists, the lab rats, I know they're good scientists as well, they knew best. And in England, we had this terrible crisis and people died. That's a fact, making war on nature. Now I'm not saying, so maybe I should have a pause quickly. Now, I'm not saying anything like that is happening 
in our kitchens, but the general approach is to neglect the instinct of the nurturing, the working with nature. We need to make a place for the gatherer as well as the hunter, if you like. And that is when, well, I want to ask the question again, where are all the women chefs? Uh, where are they all? I don't know, hiding. <laughs> there are a few here. Melanie and I have been partners together, business partners, for 19 years. But there are not so many female partnerships in our trade. Why not? Is it because we're too scared? We've been kept out? We're afraid? Do young male chefs not want to listen to us? Or is our approach just out of style? Or maybe it's the press as well, as a lot of what we also think. I can't help noticing the food that women love, regional, instinctive cooking, for example, is not being celebrated in, in the top 50. Where is regional cooking going? It needs to be celebrated. I feel we will lose the old ways, the delicious, simple ways. I worry for the young men who want to be superstars and have a probe in their pocket and have forgotten what their grannies cooked. Are you serious about cooking in plastic? Vacuum packing, sous vide cooking, where is it going? Where, I don't mean, where is it going? This is really scary. We know plastic is carcinogenic. Making more plastic in more factories for more chefs and more sous vides is really bad. How do we strike a balance? Uh, well, obviously, new technology can be great. The male intellectualization of food can be great, but there must be a balance. The kitchen must welcome the gatherers as well as the hunters. And it's good to be able to acknowledge that some of our most cutting-edge kitchens already do, of course. The foraging movement that is celebrated right here part of, is all part of what we're talking about and is one part of the answer, if we get there. <laughs> it's quite hot over here. <laughs> oh, it's the lights, it's the lights. So now I've told you what I don't like. So what do I like? What am I passionate about? What I like is platters that are groaning with unctuous flavors. What I like is when things are sticky and oozing and people are not afraid to gnaw on a bone. What I'm passionate about is when food is cooked that is a celebration of the uniqueness of the occasion, the coming together of the season and the location. I love to celebrate the moment that moment when there are piles and piles of food whose beauty is natural and simple and time-honored and just waiting to be savored and not contrived or distorted through tricks and manipulation. I am happiness, like I keep saying, when the ingredients are allowed to speak for themselves. Like it or not, women do tend to cook in a different way from men and the way we respond to food is different too. But the aim and the ultimate purpose is the same. Nourishment, eating, the pleasures of being together. Whew, last paragraph. <laughs> and so here we are at a symposium. What does that mean? Well, someone told me that a symposium is a Greek word and it means a drinking banquet, a feast of love. And isn't a feast of love a worthy aspiration? If it isn't, you hunters and gatherers, I don't know what is. So, well done, everyone. <laughs>